Yeah. I discovered a lot this week. And I rack in my brain, and I truly don't know if I didn't know it or if I simply forgot it. One of the real advantages of aging, I'm coming to find out, is you get to new, learn new things all the time, many of which you already knew, but you forgot. But it's, it's a constant, I mean, it just seems amazing to me, daily, how much that I don't know about some things, and when it comes back, I say, well, I don't think I knew that. Well, we have special days, special events. We ask people to make a pledge. I'm going to start with the Christian pledge. Many Christians make this pledge, and we pledge to what we call the Christian flag. Well, here's something I found out. There is no universally accepted version of this pledge. There's not a single one that's universally accepted. The history of the Christian Pledge of Allegiance. The original ple uh, pledge went along with the history of the Christian flag. It was come up with a guy by the name of um, uh, Charles Overton, Sunday School Superintendent, and he come up with the ideal in 1897. Well, ten years later, he and a guy named Ralph Dissenhofer, that's a good old German name, a secretary to the Methodist Young People's Missionary uh, Movement brought it out in the public for the first time. A year later, another Methodist pastor, Len uh, Harold Hugh, wrote the first pledge to the flag. It was famous then. But this pledge has caused controversy over the years. It caused controversy when it came out. It still causes controversy in some churches. It causes controversy with some individual Christians. They just don't want to do that. The Pledge of Allegiance to the Christian flag is formal. It's a serious uh, promise that people make to strengthen a spiritual relationship. But what's the significance of the Christian flag? Some people wrongly, and let me emphasize that, wrongly believe that the flag represents the presence of Jesus Christ and that by displaying it and praying to him over it, we can communicate with the God of Christianity. That's totally wrong. This same practice is much like the tradition of lighting candles to symbolically recognize the presence of Jesus. Well, those are calendars, or um, candles, calendars. Those are candles, that's a flag. They have nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Traditions are traditions. They're not bad, but they're also not holy. They're just traditions. And some traditions are okay. Now, as long as you all don't get into the snake handling tradition, I'll be perfectly fine right here. But if we get into that tradition, I'll make a new door if there ain't one. What this is, when people think that, when they try to put more to physical objects rather than God the Father, it's a concept of material means to show the presence of our Lord. They're using something material. Well, Matthew 18, 20, eight, um, chapter 18, verse 20. Now, this is a King James Version. I don't use it a lot, but I like it in this one. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. I like that. Colossians 1, 17. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Psalms 46, 7. The Lord of, heaven's, uh, Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Galatians 5, 26. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? Joshua 1, 9. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. No flag needed. No candles needed. No church building needed. No pulpit needed. Nothing needed except you to be gathered 
worshiping God, where two or three are gathered. We basically can see the Christian flag in the same manner. It's just an emblem. It's emblematic of our faith in God. Every person, every congregation are free to observe this tradition, this custom, or not. You don't have to. The church doesn't have to. If we choose to it, we're fine. If we choose not to, we're fine. I personally, as a pastor, have no problem with it. I understand what it is and what it represents. So long as you understand that, there shouldn't be an issue. But if you think it's more, like I said, it's, those are choices. Okay, now if I could get the slide of the American Pledge. There we go. Now here's the one we just repeated. I found out some stuff about it. Now, most of us should have learned this in school. I don't know if I did or not. But this, uh, the pledge timeline starts September 9th, 1892. Well, what happened to 1776? Hmm. We're a little late coming to the game, I guess. September 9th, 1892. The pledge was introduced to the magazine in the Youth's Companion as part of a program to celebrate Columbus Day in schools across the country. The words were written by Francis Bellany, a Baptist minister and Christian socialist. I'm not 100% sure how you tie those things together, but evidently he did. And here's the original pledge as he wrote it. I pledge allegiance to my flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Well, that rocked and rolled until June 14, 1923, when the National Flag Conference, sponsored by the American Legion and Daughters of the American Revolution, changes my flag to the flag of the United States of America. In part, part of the rationale was to ensure that recent immigrants had the U.S. flag in mind and not the flag of their nation when they were given the flag, when they were given the oath. Now we move on up to June 22nd, 1942. Now we're getting in some of our lifespans here. Congress formally recognized the pledge, included it in the federal flag code on December 22nd, 1942. That's when it became our official pledge. Congress changes the official manner of delivery by placing the uh, right hand over the heart. The previous stance... I did not know this, it was one hand extended from the body, palm up towards the flag. But it was too reminiscent of a Nazi salute. So they changed it to this. But the original flag, for those years, people would do this in America. Anybody else know that? I didn't either. You knew that? Pam knew it. But I didn't know that. That was kind of like, wow. Now, you remember Bellamy, and it was called the Bellamy Salute. He was a socialist. I guess you should expect that from a socialist. I don't know. Now, June 14th, uh, 1954, President Eisenhower approved a congressional resolution adding, <coughs> excuse me, adding the words, under God, to the pledge. The Knights of Columbus and other groups, as well as Eisenhower, uh, himself had lobbied for the change. The words and manner of the delivery of the pledge and the allegiance are currently laid out in Title IV, Chapter 1, Section 4 of the United States Code. Now that is your history lesson for today. Did I do okay, ma'am? Yeah. Okay. Now you can go ahead back to the other PowerPoint and um, we'll go on with the message for today. As we see on our PowerPoint, as we see of the people that have served here, some, some of our veterans, David comes to mind, gave all. Gave all. They gave the life for us. But every person you see up there in uniform, or out of uniform, or working on these pictures, like you see, took an oath. They swore to defend the Constitution 
this nation, our freedoms, with their life. I don't care what their job was, what their branch of service was, they took an oath. Willingly, they would lay down their life if necessary. I'm kind of like MacArthur. The goal should be to get the enemy to lay down their life for their country, but sometimes it takes American lives. Stanley's memories, he'd bring back the dead from Vietnam of the smell. Maybe many of you can relate, but the smell of death is something you never, ever forget. I want to start this part before we go too far with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I stand before you, your people, to deliver your message. Through the words you give me, I've prepared this message. I pray that this message is your message in its entirety. I pray your blessings and anointing on its delivery, its reception, and most of all, its application in our lives. I found that prayer from another pastor, and it struck a chord with me, because that's the same thing I pray all the time. The only message I want to give is God's message. Never my message, but God's message. Now, the Bible contains a lot of information about serving in the military. I don't know if they still do this, but when I went to boot camp, they give me a little Bible. And in 19, when did Alex go to the Marines? It's on there. When Alex went to the Marines, they gave him one in the induction center. I don't know if they still do or not, but they, they gave us a Bible. Um, we used to give them out in prison quite a bit, the little Bibles. The Gideons supply all those, and we used to give them out. But it contains plenty of information about it. But now, the Bible has many references and analogies about veterans serving military. But the Bible does not specifically state whether or not someone should serve in the military. There is no biblical command that you join the military. There's no biblical authority that should compel you to join the military. But there's also no prohibition from joining. And everything I read in the Bible shows a high degree of respect for the people in the military. When I was working in federal prison in the 70s, we had whole, I had actually, I had a glorious job back then. I was in charge of the laundry. Now, if you can imagine what it's like back in the 70s, no air conditioning, and a big laundry for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of inmates, washing clothes, drying clothes, um, ironing clothes. Um, it's just, it was hot. And the ones that worked for me, the main crew I had, were draft dodgers. Draft dodgers. Ooh, boo, boo, right? These are some of the hardest working, most ethical young men I ever knew. Each one was a Christian. Each one thought they had an obligation not to go to the military. They didn't go to Canada. They didn't run and hide. They simply refused to serve, and they got federal time for it. They come in, and at first, when I seen what kind of detail I had, I was not really happy about it. But as I got to know these men, watching them work, talking to them, see how they acted, probably the greatest, nicest group of inmates the federal system ever had. They earned my respect. They disagreed with what I believe. It's okay to disagree. But they paid the price. and They never complained. The Bible doesn't tell us that we have to or that we should not. Christians, as a Christian, we can rest assured. A soldier is highly, highly respected in the uh, scriptures. And I've got some things in here to cover that. Do you know when the very first example of military service is found in the Bible? It's really early. Okay, I'll give you a hint. It starts in Genesis. Ooh. Genesis 14. Ooh. You want to know what happened in Genesis 14? Abraham's nephew Lot was kidnapped. Kidnapped by the king of Elam. 
and his allies. Abraham rallied to Lot's aid by gathering 318 trained men of his household and defighting the Emelites. That was the first standing army. He gathered them together. They were trained. Here we see armed forces doing what armed forces have done throughout history if there are good armed forces. Rescuing and protecting the innocent. Rescuing and protecting the innocent. Now Israel, who we hear a lot about today, was pretty late in developing an army. Why? Their trust and faith in that God was the divine warrior and would protect his people regardless of their military strength was part of a reason why Israel was really slow to develop an army. This development of a regular standing army in Israel came only after a strong centralized political system, I read that, had been developed by Saul, David, and Solomon. Saul was the first to form a permanent army in 1 Samuel 13 2, 24 2, and 26 2. What Saul began, David continued. He increased the size of the army, brought in hired troops from other regions. He turned over the direct leadership to his commander in chief, Joab. So we got our first commander of the military. Under David, Israel also became more aggressive in its offensive military policies, absorbing neighboring states. David established a system of rotating troops with 12 groups of 24,000 men each serving one month a year. Not much unlike Israel's army today, where many of them are citizens and they serve in the military and they rotate. They haven't changed the pattern a whole lot. During Solomon's uh, reign, he expanded the military even further and he added chariots and horsemen and the standing army continued divided along the kingdom after the death. But Israel lost its army. Anybody know when? 586 B.C. when Judah ceased to exist as a political entity. In the New Testament, now let's, let's get closer to home. Jesus marveled when a Roman centurion, an officer in charge of 100 soldiers, that's pretty good commander, 100 soldiers, approached him. The centurion's response indicated his clear understanding of authority as well as faith in Jesus. Jesus did not denounce his career. That's key. When Jesus discovered that some of his disciples were carrying swords, the firearms of today, he didn't denounce that either. But he did not denounce the career of this military officer. Many centurions mentioned in the uh, New Testament are praised as Christians, God fears, and men of good character. And that's all in Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts. All the scriptures are in your bulletin. The places and titles have changed, but our armed forces should be just as valued as the centurions were in the Bible. The position of a soldier was highly respected, but we lost that somewhere. When they come home from World War II, there was great celebrations. When they come home from Korea, there were less, and it took a long time to even get them to be declared that they're worthy of anything. They, they treated Koreans, Korean veterans rotten. And in Vietnam, it got even worse. Many of our Vietnam veterans did not get any respect. But now as far as who's serving, as of January 31st, there was close to 1.4 million people serving in the U.S. Armed Forces. This comes from a Defense Manpower Data Center part of the DOD. That means a grand total of 0.04% of Americans population is serving. 0.04%. We got a very few carrying the load for everybody else. As of 2014, uh, VA estimated there were 22 million uh, 
veterans in the U.S. population. I couldn't find a more current figure. If you added these figures to the um, veterans on the active personnel uh, numbers, it goes to 7.3% of all Americans have served in the military at some point in their life. 7.3%. Man, that leaves a whole bunch, 96-something, you know, that never served. But it gets even more tilted. Two million veterans and about 200,000 of the current personnel are women. Overall, percentages varies a lot by gender. 1.4% of all females have served in the armed forces or are serving, compared to 134 of all males. So when you look at a male out there, odds are, if they served, it was greater than females and greater than others, but at 13.4%. But now here's really an, another fact. I told you this is a learning class. The vast majority of U.S. military never see any combat at all. None. I never saw one day of combat. Most, the vast majority, 40% of military personnel are never deployed outside the United States. I never left the United States while in uniform. I did while well working for Justice Department, but never in the military did I leave these shores. We were nuclear weapons. You didn't want me hauling them off anywhere, but we stayed. Most foreign deployments are not into combat zones. U.S. military has estimated 800 bases around the world. Most are not in active combat zones. 60% of the military deployed, and only about 10 to 20 are sent to a 20, uh, 10 to 20 percent are sent to active war zones. As we see on our PowerPoint, we have some with the Purple Heart, some that have been killed in combat. So some of ours were seen to combat. Most people in the military are in a support capacity. According to the 2019 statistics, only 10 percent of the entire military force engage in battle, while there's eight to nine in a support role for every combat soldier. But I found something in talking to people through the years, almost universally, not so much in church, but almost universally when I talk to anybody about their service in Viet or their service, they were in Vietnam and they're in combat. So I'm running across that 10% a lot, many. Sadly, since 9-11, that statistic is going to change. We're seeing more and more combat, boots on the ground. I don't have all the figures from Afghanistan and all that horrible mess. But most of us have not seen the horrors of war. Not with our eyes. Stanley mentioned the smell of death. I've smelled it. I smell human beings that have been burned alive. Those are horrible things. But most of us haven't seen the actual combat, the men, women, and children, until now. Sadly, you're seeing it now. Turn on your TV. Turn on your TV. Turn on your smart, that, that phone you have in your pocket, if you turn it on, you can go to live scenes of combat and seeing people brutalized and killed. I don't know what that's going to do to our country. I don't know what that's going to do to our world. I don't know if it's going to desensitize, desensitize us or make us all neurotic. I don't know. We're seeing this in our own eyes, on our own TVs and phones, in real time for the most part. I was watching Huddy over in Israel, and a, um, one of the um, missiles come in from Gaza, exploded right there next to him. And he was rattled. I mean, you not only see the explosion, you see the results of the people, and you see the reaction. Nothing ever before have American pe have as anybody that wasn't in a combat zone had to deal with that. I think it's not good. I think that we need to really, really turn to God, and I hope you're doing what I'm doing. I've severely limited what I allow myself to watch anymore. 
I've limited it. There doesn't need to be those images with every other image I got in my brain. I don't need to add more images in my brain. We've not always treated our veterans right. We're still not. The VAs are a disgrace. The VA hospitals, they're a disgrace. They're, they're, we've got to do better. A good percentage of the homeless are made up of veterans. Some of them PTSD, some of them mental things, usually some type of an abuse problem, drugs, alcohol, many, many things causing it, but we're not working as a society to do anything about it. When we start exercising our rights, people are pretty quick to, I have a right, I have a freedom. You have that right and you have that freedom because one of those 10% that's seen combat has given us that right. You're not speaking German, you're not speaking Japanese, you're not speaking any other language but English because of that reason. We need to respect and honor those who served. Found this poem, I guess it's a poem, it's written like a poem, but I thought it was worth sharing today because today I want to recognize the veterans, the ones who have served, the ones who have given so much. And by the way, if someone's in our church and they're not on the PowerPoint, I need the information and the picture and I can get them on there. I need it on David. I need, I need stuff up there that you want to share. Okay, here we go. It is the veteran, not the preacher, who has given us freedom of religion. I can't give you freedom of religion. I have the freedom of religion that I can preach to you. God has authorized that to me, but I can't give that to you. The veteran did. The veteran can. It is the veteran, not the reporter, who's given us the freedom of press. It's the veteran, not the poet, who's given us freedom of speech. It's the veteran, not the campus organizer, who's given us freedom to assemble. These Campus organizers now are all organizing all over the country and really against the soldiers in Israel defending their country, against our soldiers that are deployed. It's beginning to remind me of some of the protests from Vietnam again, the flashbacks of those protests. It's the veteran, not the lawyer, who's given us the right to a fair trial. We would not get a fair trial under a dictatorship. There's one of my birds right there. In the Vietnam, it's the veteran, not the politician, who's given us the right to vote. When you have a right to vote, it's because you have a free nation. It's the veteran who salutes the flag. I'll notice when people are saluting or pledging to the flag that there are some that do it very respectfully, respectfully. There are others that do not. Some of the folks today have taken to kneeling during the pledge. Kneeling when we play the national anthem. Kneeling. We need to thank the veteran for that right that lets them kneel. It's the veteran who serves under the flag and it's the veteran buried by the flag. My dad never talked much about his military service. He was in the Philippines, World War II, Air Force. He was a fireman. And they used to have aircraft come in, the ones that would make it back to land, they'd be on fire, they'd be burning, they'd crash on the way in, they'd be dead inside. And Dad would have to go in there and, A, put the plane out, then get any survivors off, then retrieve any bodies. Dad never spoke much about that. I didn't hear much about it until I was about 12 years old. We visited an old buddy of his from that same unit in Tennessee, 
They'd served together. Dad, him, the two mothers, they all sat there at that kitchen table in Tennessee. And I was in and out of the room, but I would hear enough to know what those men suffered through. And it just, I really didn't want to hear much more. But Dad didn't share that. Not with me, not with us. But they did share it with each other because they had that bond, that brotherhood. We're told in the Bible, greater love has no one has no one than this, that to lay down one's life for his friends, John 15, 13. And we're also told, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, Ephesians 6, 12. As a church, we need to go forth loving and serving each other, other people, every day bringing joy where we can, but respecting all. And we need to honor people who have served. We need the people that are serving us today, the police officers, the firemen, teachers, school administrators, coaches, cooks. There are many people that serve you every day. You serve each other in your families. We are all servants, one way or another. We all serve in some capacity, and we should respect each other for that. We don't all do the same thing. The body of Christ has many, many different functions. There's hands, there's fingers, there's feet, there's arms. There's all kinds of parts of the body. And we each have our part to do. And I read, read something one time about, and you might think that there are some parts not as important as another. Now, most people don't consider their bottom end to be all that important. Try to go without it for just about a day. It will shut down every other part of your body quicker than you can say anything. Okay. Veterans are called to serve. Did you know that? They're called to serve. Hmm. Now, who are they called by? I think sometimes God leads us that way. I do. But they're also called by man. They're currently talking about bringing the draft back. Now, why do you think they want the draft back? Are we in an armed conflict? Major war? Why do we need the draft back? Because many of the youth today are physically, mentally incapable of serving. Some of the ones serving probably shouldn't be serving. The youth of today has not been raised with the attitude of appreciating and loving our nation, our country, and service. Many of them don't have that. A draft would enable them to gather the whole kettle clean out the good ones, throw away the others, and pick the best. It actually makes sense in our society. As much as I don't want to see it, it makes sense. That's my presentation on the military. I normally don't do this, but has anybody got any comments that they want to make about veterans, service, anything they want to add to it? Many of you have family that are serving, have served. Some of you have served that are in this room. So we're going to play Baptist and not say a word. <laughs> Remember, we're an independent church. We can talk. All right. Well, I hope, I hope this message meant something to you. It meant something to me. Because I think that we really need to give our thoughts to these men, these women who are serving, and the young ones who are coming up that will serve. And look at everybody that's serving today is way younger than I am, even their commanders. So they come up after all my stuff was done, after all your stuff was probably done, and now they're doing it. Well, there's another generation coming up that'll be doing the same thing. We need to also pray for them, pray for the future police officers, teachers, leaders, preachers, 
Pray for people. All right. Almighty God, we lift up to you the memory of our military, the men and women who have served, honorably protecting our nation and our freedoms. We also lift you up, all the military men and women of the United States of America. We ask you for your divine protection upon every one of them. We ask that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The congregation said, Amen. Amen.